Welcome everybody to nine lessons from three elections. This is an event put on by the Department of History at the University of Memphis. Uh, my name is Aaron Gaduzian. I'm a professor in the department. I'm gonna introduce my colleagues in just a second. Uh, we have designed this event around, of course, the upcoming presidential election, which is uh, a historic election by, by, any, by any stretch, right? It is, we're in the midst of, the, of a health crisis with, with COVID-19. Uh, we've witnessed uh, amazing protests for racial justice, uh, battles over Supreme Court nominations, and of course, uh, the current president who creates an atmosphere of controversy and chaos and excitement. Um, so here we are, what we hope with this event not to predict what happens in 2020, but more so to uh, try to provide some perspective on how we got to where we, where we are today. Let me remind you, please, if you, if you, if you haven't to make sure that you are on mute. All right, um, the format for tonight is that uh, our three panelists will each for roughly eight to 10 minutes uh, tackle one of the three elections in a row. We're gonna look at 1964, 1968, and 1972. Um, and, and then at that point, we will open it up to a conversation. Uh, we ask you to use the chat function on Zoom, or if you're watching on Facebook, uh, on the Herc page, uh, please feel free to put comments in there. We'll monitor that as well. Um, and we will, we will definitely stop at exactly seven o'clock we we, out of respect for your time. So it'll be a, a brisk event. We know. Uh, let me introduce my, my colleagues. Speaking on 1964 will be Dr. Scott Marler. Uh, Dr. Marler, is, much of his earlier research is in the 19th century South. He's the author of an award-winning book called The Merchant's Capital uh, about New Orleans and the political economy of the 19th century. Uh, but he's an expert on political history across American history. His current project is, is on 20th century politics and particularly on conspiracy theories uh, and the rise of the right in the 1960s and beyond. Uh, he is a award-winning teacher, is a winner of the Briggs Teaching Award, a very prestigious award, uh, and he teaches courses on conspiracy theory, constitutional history, surveys in U.S. history, and more. Uh, he'll be talking about 1964. I'll be talking about uh, the election of 1968. Um, I'm a historian mostly of the civil rights movement in, in its various manifestations, but my most recent book, this one, is called The Men and the Moment. It is a short history of the 1968 election. Critics rave about it. They call it short, uh, and others call it not too long. Um, and that's pretty much it, it, it's, um, its best feature. Um, and then speaking on 1972 is my colleague, Dr. Sarah Potter. She's the author of a book, Everybody Else, Adoption and the Politics of, uh, of Domestic Diversity in Post-War America. Uh, her interests are in gender, in politics, in the family, and her new project is bringing together a lot of those interests. Uh, it's entitled Your Cheating Heart, and it's, kind of, it's about the politics of adultery, uh, both from the left with, with feminism and from the right with the rise of the new right. So it's a fascinating subject. Uh, and hopefully our particular research interests will help to drive uh, our analysis of these three elections. So now let me turn it over to Dr. Marler and 1964. Okay, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to talk with you about the 1964 election, which overlaps with some of my current interests, my research into conspiracism after World War II, particularly um, on the far right. So it's, I found it kind of difficult to isolate lessons um, that were applicable from 1964 to 2020. The dynamics are, are so different. For one thing, you had a liberal Lyndon Baines Johnson up for election in his own right for the very first time, um, not a conservative. Um, so the most crucial difference, however, was the fact that Lyndon Johnson had succeeded to the presidency as vice president um, just a year before upon the assassination of the popular glamorous rock star president, John F. Kennedy. Um, and it's not too much to say that Kennedy's subsequent martyrdom um, which LBJ did his best to uh, harness to his advantage, um, that after that, arguably, the outcome of the 1964 election was never seriously in doubt. So that's one of the reasons why I found it a little difficult to frame this within the topic of lessons, per se. Um, so I decided I'm going to organize my primer on the 1964 election, sort of like a McGuffey's reader, um, by alphabet-based mnemonics. Um, so I don't, I don't get 26 letters, so I chose three letters for my election, 
Um, and so my three letters will be C, R, and S. Now you'll notice too that I'm in black and white right now, wearing a vest and throwing these placards around. And for those of you in the know, this is supposed to be an homage um, to Bob Dylan's contemporary protest song, Subterranean Homesick Blues, which I thought had come out in 1964, uh, but in fact, it came out in 65. Um, but just like the current administration, never let the facts get in the way of a clever idea. So uh, I'll start with the letter C. Um, and most of you think I'm gonna talk about conspiracy, but in fact, I'm not. I'm going to talk mainly first about conservatism. Conservatism was an ideology that had been dead pretty much since the 1930s, uh, with a few exceptions like Senator Robert Taft during the 1950s. But it had been enjoying an intellectual resurgence and had various wings that had developed. And the first kind of national political figure of any note, after Taft at least, um, was Barry M. Goldwater, a senator from Arizona. So going into the 1960 election, Richard M. Nixon, a moderate, had been, had been nominated, a so-called moderate, um, and had lost the election in a squeaker. And after that, the conservative wing of the party really started to organize at the grassroots. And as a result, by the time the 1964 election cycle runs around, centrism in the Republican Party is terribly out of fashion. Um, the idea of compromising um, with the liberal Democrats is beyond the kin um, of the conservatives and, uh, and the far-right extremists who had insinuated themselves into party councils, particularly at the state and local levels through organizations like the John Birch Society. So campaigns, I want to mention, have consequences. And the 1964 campaign, even a losing campaign, has major consequences because the 1964 campaign, which ultimately Barry Goldwater lost in one of the greatest landslides in the popular vote since a century before in the 1864 election, um, nonetheless served as a kind of training ground for a generation of Republican strategists, some of whose names are still around today, um, like Roger Stone um, cut his teeth in 1964, and there are a few others as well. <clears throat> But let's turn our attention just briefly to the Democrats who in some ways are far less interesting in 1964 in most ways. Um, the Democrats were a large coalition, a liberal coalition, one that had been in place since the 1930s in Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and that coalition was um, indeed the victor by far in the 1964 election. However, um, the larger coalitions get, the more fragile they are. Um, and so you can see the 1964 election as the apogee of the New Deal coalition that had been in charge of the Democratic Party for a long time. And you can start to see the first fissures in the, um, in the Democratic Party in the 1964 election. Those become totally manifest um, just four years later by 1968. I'm going to turn attention to a little bit of, um, of personal style issues. So if you want to think that the current administration has a monopoly on crude and coarse behavior, you're wrong. You should take a look back at some of Lyndon Johnson's behavior, um, which was vile to the extreme, although the media at the time mostly kept that behavior under wraps. Um, corruption was also pretty much rife in the Johnson administration. Um, Johnson had been known to play fast and loose with characters like Bobby Baker, his former aide. Um, who solicited prostitutes for prominent members of the Senate, or Billy Saul Estes, uh, an even more unsavory character from Texas politics. But it didn't, it, it, Johnson was sort of Teflon in that regard. And one other personal quality that I would um, bring up is charisma. Um, charisma was in short supply in the 1964 election. Uh, Lyndon Johnson had a folksy, barnstorming style of campaigning but charisma, charismatic, I would not call him. And even worse was Barry Goldwater. And part of this was a function of Goldwater's reluctance to be a presidential candidate whatsoever. But he was always very uncomfortable in the spotlight, um, a very wooden speaker at best. Um, he had a cult following um, as the sort of national poster child of, of resurgent conservatism. But even those conservatives um, that backed him would be disappointed in his performance particularly after he gained the nomination um, in 1964. And he gained the nomination, let's move to the letter R, um, the Republican nomination, of course. 
And we talk about a few of the Republicans that were around that year, notably Nelson Rockefeller, who was the front runner um, going into the election of 1964 for the Republican Party. Um, but Rockefeller was of the moderate wing of the Republican Party. And this was not the year to be a moderate um, amongst Republicans. And moreover, Rockefeller imploded um, as a result of his own sexual and marital peccadilloes. And then you can't get away with not mentioning Richard M. Nixon. Fun fact about Richard Nixon, this is the only election between 1948 and 1976 that Richard M. Nixon did not have a place on the Republican national ticket. Think about that. Um, but the last and most famous figure associated with the letter R that we can't go by without mentioning would be Ronald Reagan himself. The 1964 election and a nationally televised speech that Reagan gave the week before the election on um, uh, made his name nationally. He was already known, he was already popular in the spotlight, but he became a national political figure um, after that speech and was elected governor of California in a landslide just two years later in 1966. But if we look at bigger political trends um, that are largely associated again with the Republican party, we could talk about regionalism and regional resentments. And Barry Goldwater is the voice of these regional resentments. Um, Goldwater once famously said um, he thought that the country would be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and set it out to sea. Um, Richard Nixon would continue to voice these kinds of complaints against the liberal intelligentsia of the East, and such complaints are still rife today, of course. And they are part and parcel of what would become a realignment of the parties, which historians are increasingly beginning to identify with the 1964 election. Um, it really slowly re emerges in 1968 and 72, gets a setback, and then under Ronald Reagan in 1980 is when you can really see that Republican realignment take place. And most historians of recent vintage have identified race and racism as the kind of key elements um, in the solidification of that Republican coalition as we turn our attention now to the letter S and we look in particular at the South um, because it's the Southern states and their opposition to desegregation, um, particularly as articulated nationally by George Corley Wallace, the governor of Alabama who famously said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever in his stand in the schoolhouse door. Note all these S's I managed to work in here. Um, and he articulates the rage of, of Southern whites um, at the idea of desegregating public schools and other public facilities and the massive resistance uh, that was being incurred as a result thereof. But it's more than just the South. I mean, Goldwater carries the five states of the old Confederacy, the deep South states of the old Confederacy and his home state of Arizona, all that just barely. Um, but what we're talking about seeing the emergence of um, is the emergence of the Sun Belt Rim a rim that stretches along the South all the way from Miami um, through the Old South, through rising cities in places like Houston and Dallas, um, and then all the way up um, into Phoenix and Southern California, most notably Orange County, which was probably the place most associated with the John Birch Society um, and far right elements, although Dallas and Houston give it a run for its money. So that's the sense of the Republican realignment. And notice I'm talking quickly here. There's so much to be said and there will be a Q and A. Scandal is another element of the election of 1964. Actually, it wasn't that big except for Nelson Rockefeller um, who it set aside. But three weeks before the election took place, um, Lyndon Johnson's chief of staff, Walter Jenkins uh, was arrested in a public restroom just blocks from the White House engaged in um, behavior that was not sanctioned under the law at that time. Um, and it was amazing how Johnson managed to quash this. Um, even though the arrest went public, uh, the media cooperated in keeping this away. That's my timer, by the way. Um, in keeping this out of the public eye and it didn't affect the election, kind of like the Access Hollywood tapes didn't either. And gold star families, including Kazir Khan and his wife and the widow of Sergeant David. Who's that? Anyway, um, slogans in the 1964 are also important. Um, slogans like Goldwater's campaign slogan, 
in your heart, you know he's right, with the, which the Johnson administration successfully rebranded as in your guts, you know he's nuts. Um, another in, uh, sound bite, for example, though, the most famous line to come out of the election in 1964 was at the convention when Goldwater accepted the nomination and famously said that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Um, that actually sounds like fairly tame rhetoric to us now, um, but at the time it was scandalous in particular because there had been something of a brown scare the previous two years. Um, brown scare meaning a, a fear of homegrown fascism in the United States. And, and here was Goldwater de defending the extremist elements who everyone knew had helped him gain the nomination in the first place. Elements like Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, we shouldn't forget Phyllis Schlafly, who had written back-to-back best-selling uh, quasi-conspiratorial books um, about mainly about foreign policy, which was her metier early in her career. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention the first female presidential um, uh, candidate for a major party um, in the 1964 election, Margaret Chase Smith um, ran for president. Um, she was a moderate, so in a, in a year in which moderates were scorned, as well as the enormous condescension that was heaped on her um, as a woman. Okay, well, I'm over time. Um, that's about all I've got. I hope you can draw something out of that. If you thought that this was scattershot, um, I'm sure my colleagues will do better. But in the meantime, just shoot me. Thanks, y'all. I vote to my colleague, Dr. Scott Marler, who that's going to be a very tough act to follow. Uh, I'm in just regular color. I don't have any props. Uh, so prepare to be disappointed. Um, what, what Scott has set up for us is, in 1964, uh, in, four years later in 1968, uh, we're operating under a very different backdrop in terms of, in terms of the nature of the country. Uh, 1968 is, uh, is a year of, of an atmosphere of chaos. Uh, it is a year of assassinations, the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy. It is a year of violence. Uh, when you think about the 1968 Democratic National Convention, um, you think about the, the rioting that occurs in a number of American cities upon King's assassination. Uh, it is a year of political tumult, which is what I'll discuss today. So it's, it's important to remember that 1968 has attracted a lot of attention from historians because of its exceptionally dramatic backdrop. Uh, but it's also a very important election because it has uh, ramifications that really speak to how we got to where we are today in many ways. Uh, so my, I have three lessons. And my first lesson, I, I think, is that the 68 election signaled the destruction of the Democratic coalition that Dr. Marler was talking about, right? Since the New Deal, since the 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, the Democratic Party had been very successful in forging a coalition that dominated presidential politics uh, for much of the middle of the 20th century. It included white Southerners, the traditional aspect within the Democratic Party, uh, but also labor unions with favorable New Deal legislation, uh, liberal intellectuals who are associated with the New Deal, uh, big city party bosses, uh, sort of uh, the, the key power brokers, uh, people like Mayor Richard Daley in Chicago, uh, farmers who benefited from New Deal legislation, and racial, uh, increasingly racial and ethnic minorities. You know, for instance, take African Americans who had traditionally voted loyal to the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, as they, uh, as African Americans uh, moved north and established political power bases where they could vote. Uh, more and more, more and more often you're seeing African Americans vote Democratic. So the, the Democratic Party is, is this odd and powerful coalition uh, that dominates presidential politics through the mid 1960s. Uh, the Democratic Party sells itself on the ability to solve crises, to use the power of the federal government, think about the Great Depression, to ensure prosperity, to manage the economy through experts, uh, and also to, to, to wage important foreign campaigns, to defeat fascism during World War II, to combat communism in, in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, and this intensifies when Lyndon Johnson becomes president in 1963 and then winning his own election in 64, as Scott had said. The, the Great Society legislation that he passes includes the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, immigration legislation, uh, federal aid for education, Medicare, Medicaid, a whole slate of liberal programs. But as Scott was suggesting, in 1964, even, that, that coalition is already starting to fall apart. The first to go are the white Southerners. They're leaving because of, the, uh, uh, because of civil rights legislation, and that's why they're voting for Goldwater in 64. Uh, and then in 68, the coalition itself breaks down, and there are two key elements within that. One was what, at the time, the shorthand for it was the problem of the cities, what we sometimes call the urban crisis. But that's also kind of a shorthand for talking about race and poverty and violence. 
Um, the Great Society for, for all its anti-poverty legislation isn't really tackling the sort of structural racist issues uh, that, that keep African-Americans confined uh, and, and in poverty in, in many American cities. Uh, and in 1967, in particular, we see this boil over. Uh, it's a summer of, of violence in American cities and two major riots, one in Newark, New Jersey, and the other in Detroit. Uh, and then, of course, with King being assassinated April 4th, 1968, that leads to another round of this, of, of this, vi of this violence, including in uh, Chicago and Washington, D.C., even within two of them blocks of the White House. On the left they're of, uh, of the liberals, they're discontent. They say they're not meeting the scale of this challenge. Uh, that uh, the black power activists are frustrated with, with, with liberal politics. Um, on the right, uh, increasingly uh, leaving the Democratic Party are more and more members of the white working class who resent the tax hikes associated with the Great Depression, who feel like politics is kind of a zero sum game and those resources are being allocated to, to, to racial minorities rather than to them. Uh, and so race becomes kind of a, a key wedge issue within the Democratic Party that extends beyond the South by 1968 increasingly. The second key element in the breakdown of the Democratic Party in 68 uh, is really the Vietnam War. Uh, under Lyndon Johnson, there is an escalation of troops from a relatively small number to, by the end of his term, almost 500,000 American troops in Vietnam. Um, and in, for much of, that, of, of, that, of uh, the war, there's been sort of positive messages coming to the American public about progress in the war. Uh, the General William Westmoreland famously says in December of 1967 that you can see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of this conflict. But then uh, in February of 1968 is the so-called Tet Offensive, a big North Vietnamese attack into South Vietnam. Uh, and that is a political failure for the Johnson administration because it shows that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and really, this is Viet the Vietnam War, from, from this perspective, is really a political failure on the part of Lyndon Johnson. He'd been gradually escalating troops and intensifying the bombing in North Vietnam without having a real conversation with the American people or even going through Congress uh, to really talk about the costs of the war and when, whether this was a war worth waging. Uh, and thus he left himself in a political trap, so to speak, by 1968 as the United States seems stuck in the war. It's Vietnam in particular that leads to challenges within the Democratic Party. Now, Johnson is, is, could run for re-election in 1968. Uh, he's, his name is on the ballot in the New Hampshire primary. Uh, and Eugene McCarthy uh, will run as a candidate against him. Later, Robert Kennedy will enter, will enter the race, both launching challenges from the leftward flank of the Democratic Party, in particular with their discontent over the waging of the Vietnam War. Johnson famously decides uh, at the very end of March of 1968 to not run for a second term. Uh, this is shocking to, to, to most Americans, uh, but that leaves his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, uh, to become sort of the establishment candidate and to try to heal this rift, to try to keep that old coalition together for one last election. Uh, and he can't do it. Um, and this becomes quite evident by uh, the, the Democratic National Convention in August of 1968, when there's anti-war activists on the streets of Chicago, setting up camps, marching through the streets, clashes with police, using profanity. Uh, and Mayor Richard Daley in Chicago uh, uses his police force in very brutal fashion uh, to attack the demonstrators day after day after day and is captured on the news. Uh, but what ends up happening as this sort of reflecting the new mood of the country in many ways is that uh, poll data shows that most Americans tend to support the police rather than the protesters. So uh, there's a discontent brewing uh, with, uh, with, with a majority of Americans or Americans in the middle with those uh, protesters on the left. And that leads to in some ways the Democrats' enduring problem for the next half century. Uh, some, some scholars refer to it as the class Democrats and the conscience Democrats. The class Democrats are kind of the old constituents rooted in labor unions and the big city party bosses who see politics as kind of transactional. You know, we deliver the votes, what's in it for us, what services are there for us. Uh, and they feel like the Democratic Party is falling apart on, on that regard. And these tend to be more of the political centrists within the party. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's the so-called conscience Democrats, uh, that tend to be more white collar rather than blue collar, uh, that tend to be more socially liberal, to incorporate more racial and ethnic minorities, to be more concerned with issues of social justice. Uh, and we can trace this forward, right? The, the, in, in various elections from here on in, the two, the two ends of the party uh, butt heads quite often and, and, can't, and often can't support each other in an effective way. Uh, maybe that is ending in 2020 because of the unique circumstances that we have here. So the first lesson here is maybe this is the time for the reconstitution of a genuine democratic coalition 
uh, and we, we can talk about what that might look like in 2020. Uh, the unique challenge of the Trump presidency is perhaps bringing together a very wide uh, political slate on the part of the Democrats. So that's lesson one. Lesson two, this election highlights the influence of what people refer to at the time as the new politics. It's a, pundits were consist, constantly buzzing about this idea of the new politics. And there was no kind of one meaning to it. In, in essence, in general, basically, what it means is that, it's a, that it should be a new way for the party to select its nominee for the presidency. Basically, the idea is that you try to take politics more directly to the people within the primary process. Uh, the old politics uh, suggests that it's the party leaders, the party bosses, the party officials who choose the, the candidate for the presidency. Uh, you're, 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 as you know, we have a primary system now, but the kind of primary system we have now where, where the primaries actually count in terms of delegates toward the conventions and really help to select the nominee you know, directly, that wasn't there in 1968. Only a few states uh, held primaries with binding delegates. Uh, some states just had state conventions where the state officials picked. Others had a primary, but it didn't actually matter for the delegates who went to the convention. Uh, so the old politics was sort of the stereotype of the smoke-filled rooms. Those are, these are the people who actually choose your nominee for the presidency. So the first candidate in 68 associated with the new politics is Eugene McCarthy, who I mentioned. He is running against um, Lyndon Johnson for the Democratic nominee. And re really, this is, a, this is a extraordinary thing that you would run against a sitting president uh, for, for the party nomination. And it's really the Vietnam War that, that pulled McCarthy in. Now, McCarthy is not a great candidate. He's very cerebral. He's very diffident. Uh, he's not a great campaigner. He doesn't really sort of know how to sort of press the flesh, but he kind of stands as a symbol. And what really drives his campaign in New Hampshire is this enormous army of student volunteers, some of whom were too young to vote. Um, they're you know, traipsing through the cold, knocking on doors, making sure they, they meet just about every New Hampshire citizen they can and basically uh, talking about how Johnson is mishandling the war and they should vote for Eugene McCarthy uh, instead. And McCarthy ends up winning 42% of the vote in New Hampshire. And in fact, Johnson barely beats him uh, in, in, in that percentage, uh, but it's, a, it's an incredible repudiation of a sitting president uh, who, is, who at that point was slated to run for re-election. This incredible people power campaign, right? So, that's, so it, was, it was launched as kind of a challenge uh, directly through the people. Soon after that, Bobby Kennedy, the brother of the slain president, John F. Kennedy, the former attorney general, enters the election himself. And Kennedy's kind of the icon of the new politics. He's got this intense personal charisma. Uh, he uses modern technology, modern, and lots and lots of Kennedy money to bring his campaigns directly to the people. So in the remaining primaries in places like Indiana and California, he's throwing an enormous amount of resources into it to try to show the Democratic Party that he is a popular candidate, that he is the one who should um, who should represent the party going forward. And soon after he enters the election is when Johnson announces a decision not to run. So that leaves these two people on the left, McCarthy and Kennedy, often battling each other in the primaries. Um, but Kennedy's campaigns are really driven by this charisma. His rallies, he, he has train rides, he has uh, these incredible ad blitzes, and there's enormous popular enthusiasm for Kennedy. People are, you know, tear, tear at his clothes like he's a beetle or something like that. Um, <laughs> In many ways, Kennedy's trying to realign the party to say, look, we need to shift to the left. We need to include more of the young, include more of the poor, more, more black and brown people. This is where he thinks the Democratic Party needs to go. And then in June of 68, of course, Kennedy is assassinated. And that leaves the new politics within the Democratic Party sort of astray. Uh, McCarthy doesn't have the leadership or the, or the ability to really pull together the left wing of the party. Hubert Humphrey ends up assuming uh, the nomination as an establishment style candidate, as the heir to Lyndon Johnson, as the old politics. But there's one more key candidate of the new politics in 68, although people didn't call it that at the time. And that was someone who Dr. Marler mentioned earlier. That's George Waltz, the segregationist governor from Alabama. He's running for the presidency in 1968 as an independent. He's a Democrat in state politics, but in, but in 68, he runs as an independent, uh, as a third party challenge for the presidency. And his, his idea is that if he can win enough of the vote, he can, uh, uh, neither candidate will win a majority, the election will go to the House of Representatives, and they'll each have to come to him begging for his delegate, for his, for his electoral votes, and he'll be able to win concessions. Uh, so he's from Alabama, he runs on the strong law and order candidacy, he does quite well in the South, but he also uh, is really resonating with a lot of the white working class voters who are abandoning the Democratic Party uh, in, uh, by 1968. 
factory workers or sort of the stereotypical Wallace voter of 68. And Wallace is running this really people powered campaign. Uh, it's sort of an, an impromptu campaign, you know, whatever the, when the funds rise up to, to, to move to the next stop, they go. Uh, it's all sort of done in, on the fly, so to speak. Uh, but it is, but it generates so much popular enthusiasm. He actually gets people to pay admission to come to his campaign rallies, where other candidates are begging people to take their signs and their hats and, and their paraphernalia. Wallace supporters pay for that. Uh, so he is, he, he's kind of, you know, the, the, in, uh, in 2016, a lot of people were drawing parallels between Wallace's campaign in 68 and Trump's in 2016. This notion of taking our country back, of uh, making America great again, of sort of these ra uh, popular rallies that seem to be spattered with violence and threats and, uh, and uh, particularly toward uh, members of the left. Uh, that's, that's, those are the themes that Wallace runs on. So, you know, even though we think of the left as sort of the icons of the new politics with McCarthy and Kennedy, there's also Wallace. Uh, and this will have an important effect on the parties going forward. After 68, uh, the Democratic Party will initiate reforms to make the uh, to make primaries much more important to the selection of the candidacy, and the Republican Party will soon follow suit after that. Uh, so that's lesson two. Finally, lesson three. The 68 election in a lot of ways forges the identity of the modern Republican Party. The process that Scott starts to start to describe in 1964 is certainly intensifying by 68. You mentioned Nelson Rockefeller, who, who had run for the nomination uh, for a while uh, in 64. Uh, he again considers running in 1968. He's a late entry into the race. Uh, and Rockefeller is the big emblem of the moderate wing of the party, of the, of the progressive Republicans. Uh, and that was still a, a key element within the Republican Party up until the 1960s. You could be a progressive Republican. Uh, George Romney was, was, another, was another one of these. Charles Percy, the senator from Illinois, was, was, was another example of this type of uh, politician. Um, and Rockefeller is probably the most popular overall candidate running for the presidency in 1968 but he's less popular within the Republican party. The party is shifting to the, to the right. Uh, Rockefeller had hoped that he could get to the Democratic, or sorry, to the Republican National Convention in 68, uh, and they could derail the front runner, Richard Nixon, by making sure he doesn't get um, the majority of the ballots on the first, or majority of the votes on the first ballot. If you don't get the majority of votes on the first ballot, then it opens it up, uh, delegates are released from their, from their commitments, and then Rockefeller thinks he can sneak in and say, look, I'm the most electable candidate, you should elect me. But the real threat in 68 to Nixon is not Rockefeller. It's not coming from the, from the progressive wing of the party. It's coming from the more conservative wing of the party. And this goes back to another figure that Scott had mentioned, Ronald Reagan. Reagan doesn't declare for the Republican nomination, doesn't run until the actual convention itself. So he doesn't, he doesn't participate in the primaries, but he knows that he is the darling of the conservatives. Uh, in particular, the Southern conservatives. He knows that his, he's the governor of California. He's, he won there in 66, campaigning on this law and order theme, on a backlash against the Watts riot in 64, on a backlash against Berkeley demonstrators. Uh, basically, uh, you know, he's forging the language of modern conservatism. Um, and he's got a lot of sort of underground delegate strength. It's Reagan who poses the greater threat to Nixon's first ballot majority than Rockefeller. And so that leaves us with Richard Nixon. Uh, Scott had mentioned that he didn't run in 1964. Uh, he suffered from the humiliation in 1962 of losing uh, the race for governor in California. He famously said, you don't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore in, the, in that aftermath. But he'd been carefully crafting a comeback since that point, winning a lot of loyalists within the party, uh, campaigning for, for, for both uh, the progressives and the, uh, uh, and the conservative candidates within the Democratic Party, positioning himself in the center of the party as the one candidate who everyone could agree on. No one was really loved Richard Nixon, but enough Republicans at least could accept Richard Nixon. And this is where he put himself. And it was very smart, sound uh, strategy. Um, but here's the thing, over the course of the year, to stay in the center of the Republican party, Nixon has to move to the right. Because of the, uh, because of the, uh, the Ronald Reagan threat, um, he is forging this key alliance with Strom Thurmond the segregationist gov uh, governor from California, sorry, it's from South Carolina, uh, segregation senator from, from South Carolina, uh, who is a key spokesman of Southern concerns. Um, he keeps emphasizing to Thurmond how he supports the same positions on the Cold War, uh, on so-called strict constructionists in the Supreme Court, that we need conservatives in the Supreme Court, that we need a strong national defense, and that the integration of Southern schools, even though it's the law now, can take place slowly. 
he sort of assures himself on these things. And as he's gearing up toward the uh, toward his acceptance speech at the Republican convention and then into the general election, he's finding a language that Dr. Potter will talk about more, I'm sure, of talking about sort of the forgotten Americans, what later becomes known as the silent majority. And in the general election, the theme he hammers on more than anything else is this idea of law and order. Now, you might hear, be hearing those terms again in 2020. Uh, you, if you listen to the first debate, uh, uh, Donald Trump used those, that phrasing on purpose. Uh, it's basically a strict response to the social chaos of 1968. It's a way to lump together the poor Black people who are uh, rioting in, in, in cities with uh, the radicals who seem to be plotting revolution, with the filthy hippies in, in, the, in the counterculture, with the uh, with, the, with crime, with thieves and rapists uh, as crime rates are soaring in American cities. That it lumps it all together as a key social problem. And the way to respond to that is with strict discipline. And, Ray, uh, and then Nixon's uh, pick for vice president, Spiro Agnew, is in many ways a, a, a representative of the shift toward law and order. Agnew is kind of like the attack dog for the party. He kind of wrestles in the dirt for those votes uh, with George Wallace. He uses the same kind of language uh, and, and this sort of outrageous law and order uh, terminology. And Nixon, throughout 68, throughout the election, never confronts Wallace head on. He never attacks him. He never, he, uh, unlike the, the Democrats who, who, who were co constantly talking about what a scourge on democracy uh, George Wallace is, Nixon is very careful not to attack Wallace. Rather, he wants to co-opt Wallace. He starts to use a lot of the same language. Uh, there's a famous book that comes out in 1969, the next year, called The Emerging Republican Majority by a strategist named Kevin Phillips. And he talks about how the future of the party is in, where Scott was talking about, in the Sun Belt, in the suburbs, in the South. Uh, that this is, this is where the Republican Party is going to find its majority he heading forward. And as we'll see, and, and Dr. Potter will talk about this more, as the Republican Party heads forward, it finds ways to fuse sort of its traditional conservatism, low taxes, strong national defense, limited government, with what we might call populist conservatism, uh, sort of the gut issues, opposition to uh, liberalism. That could be an opposition to abortion or to uh, black power or to a, a whole host of, of uh, busing, school busing to achieve integration, all sorts of issues that, that tend to rile up sort of the more working class voters. Uh, and so that's the, that's the deal that the Republican party makes and that's what makes its coalition so politically effective in the next half century. Um, and so that's a coalition that, that has held on, uh, that populist wing of the conservatism that Donald Trump represents um, seems to be ascendant now, but it also seems to be quite fragile. So that's another theme that we can discuss as we go forward. So those are my three lessons. Democrats are destroyed in 68. New politics is on the rise, but also falls apart. And finally, it's the identity of the, of the modern Republican party is getting forged. Let me turn it over to Sarah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for those. Uh, that was great, uh, you guys. Um, I don't know that I'm going to touch on actually everything that was promised uh, because I, I'm a women's historian. <laughs> so, uh, But I will, I will talk a little bit about Nixon here. I was counting on you guys to really, really cover Nixon. Um, but OK, so I'm talking about the election of 1972. And for mine, I'm setting it up uh, with basically a historical point and then a historical lesson uh, from that point. So I'll sort of give the point first and then at the end uh, I'll draw a lesson and mine is going to be pretty quick, which is good. Uh, so my first point about 1972, Nixon won. Uh, so he was a liar, he escalated a pointless war, he was impeached and he resigned, but first he won re-election. And when I teach this, students are often really surprised by that. Uh, they've heard that he played dirty tricks on his opponents, that he paid hush money to cover up the Watergate scandal, uh, that the war was increasingly unpopular, and that he was generally not that likable. Um, so they assume he could never have been reelected, just in sort of their popular sense of, of who Richard Nixon is, like not somebody who's going to win re-election. Um, but he was. <laughs> so... Uh, and partly this is honestly due to the timeline of events as far as Watergate, right? So the Watergate burglars were caught in June of 1972, and there were some early reports uh, linking the, the Nixon campaign to the break-in before the election. But honestly, things didn't really unravel for Nixon until 1963, and he didn't resign until 1964. So he actually won handily in 1972. So as you can see here, his opponent, George McGovern, who I'll talk about in a minute, uh, got only a few electoral votes. Um, you know, this is partly, and, and again, I'll talk about McGovern in a minute, which will help uh, flesh this out. But, you know, Nixon, 
sort of undercut McGovern a little bit by promising to end the draft and draw down the war. Um, he did appeal to a silent majority, which he'd been doing since 1969, really, to um, sort of suggest that there are Americans out there who really support the war. And again, we'll talk about, about some of his strategy more in a minute. Um, but he did, uh, he also had visited China in 72. The economy was pretty good that he sort of had some things behind him in 72. Uh, and so he won 60.7% of the popular vote uh, and also notably sweeps the South, right? So as Dr. Gutsuzian mentioned, uh, the growing power of the Sun Belt and the Republican party, right? You can really see this come to fruition in 1972. But this brings me to my first lesson, which is one, even jerks can win. Uh, and I'll say without comment that this seems relevant for 2020. Um, and we don't really remember Nixon that fondly, but, but boy, did he win. All right, so point number two is that McGovern lost. So he was running against uh, George McGovern, McGovern, who was a stalwart of progressive politics. Uh, historians like him because he had a PhD in history and was a history professor in South Dakota. Um, he also, though, had a political career, of course, and he had served in the U.S. House in the late 50s. Uh, he served briefly in JFK's administration, and then he was elected senator from South Dakota in 1962. Uh, here he is. Blow this up so you can see what's behind him there. Here he is giving an anti-war speech in 1968. Uh, so he advocated for an immediate end to the Vietnam War, um, and there'd even been, been actually a kind of draft McGovern movement at the 1968 convention uh, to choose him as an anti-war candidate over Humphreys. Um, so he was already kind of known within the party, of course, as a prominent anti-war candidate. Uh, he also consistently supported women's rights, civil rights, environmentalism. Uh, he wanted expanded welfare programs, including guaranteed jobs and a guaranteed family income. He'd also been part of what Dr. Gutsuzian mentioned in terms of uh, reforming the Democratic Party's convention rules after 1968 uh, to bring in more diverse delegates uh, into the convention and to, dis uh, to decrease the power of uh, party power brokers. And so this is part of what brought him to the, the party's forefront um, in 72, right? Because all these changes actually changed the party. So the Democratic Party platform in 1972 was really among the most liberal in the party's history. Um, here he is at that 1972 convention with photos of the Kennedys above him. So he's certainly trying to claim a, a certain political legacy. Uh, he was primarily supported by the liberal and the left wing of the party. So anti-war activists, young people, feminists, African-Americans, um, you know, and, and so where this really comes down to sort of brings to a close some of the things that uh, Dr. Marler and Dr. Gutsuzny have been discussing, right? That, uh, that this was a very progressive uh, campaign, a very progressive candidate, uh, and he was pretty much portrayed by Nixon uh, as, as kind of a left-wing loony, right? That he was far too radical. Uh, and some scholars have actually supported this, right? They've said, you know, look, that basically he did. He took the party too far to the left. It was too focused on the needs of women and minorities, and it thereby really alienated the white working class voters who had been so central to the New Deal coalition, right? Who are already extremely shaky and, and in fact already leaving uh, by 72, but this didn't bring them back in, right? And so this created an opening for the Republicans to basically just scoop those guys up and pull them in uh, to the party. Now, Nixon was definitely playing on this and he was definitely trying to do this. Uh, so here's a quote from him about the campaign uh, where he's talking about a strategy regarding labor in particular, but I think you can see some of the themes we've talked about in terms of um, sort of more cultural issues. So he says, the real issues of the election are the ones like patriotism, morality, religion, not the material issues. If the issues were prices and taxes, they'd vote for McGovern. We've done things labor doesn't like. We've held wages down, but they'll support us for these other reasons. Right, so this was sort of how he was approaching uh, his campaign, especially trying to sort of, again, go to a more kind of populist uh, wing and, and scoop up people who had been former Democrats. Um, and in some ways, you know, this actually works. The AFL-CIO did not endorse McGovern, uh, which was the first time, they, they actually, they stayed neutral. They didn't endorse Nixon either, but they stayed neutral. But it's the first time since the AFL and CIO had merged that they didn't endorse the Democratic Party candidate. Um, so on the one hand, this actually starts to set up the diminishing political power of the labor movement because really the Republicans were never going to really support labor's priorities. Um, and it, you know, again, is part of this larger transition of the white working class towards more conservative politics. Um, 
To me though, I think, you know, it also, the 72 moment highlights something that has, you know, been an ongoing issue for the Democrats, which is how to balance the more progressive and more moderate parts of the party. Um, you know, as its coalition, it's, it, it brings together pretty disparate groups. Um, and we've really seen, of course, these tensions play out in the Democrats um, in the last really two presidential primaries, given the popularity of uh, Bernie Sanders and others from the kind of more progressive part of the party. Uh, so I think that's one thing to really kind of think seriously about uh, after, uh, for 1972. So uh, lesson two, part one, is that even nice guys can lose. Um, McGovern was really trying to do a lot of nice things, but he really, really, really lost. Um, and part two lesson here is that in politics can change, right? Voters' alliances change, party priorities change, that these are not static. And so that's part of why we've chosen these three elections uh, is because this is a moment between 64 and 72 uh, where some things are sort of bubbling in 64, like you saw that electoral map, uh, 72, uh, they, they've changed, right? So, okay, point number three, we might assume from all this that conservatism really carried the day in 1972. Um, and obviously that's a little bit true, right? <laughs> Nixon did win. Uh, but 1972 was also a watershed year for women in politics in multiple ways. And I wanna talk about this for a minute and in a, a few different sort of arenas. So first to kind of lay out the, the, show you the lay of the land here. So this is Congresswoman Bella Abzug from New York here on the cover of Life Magazine from 1972 about women in politics. Uh, but a, a quote from her talking about 1972 was quote, we put sex discrimination provisions into everything. There was no opposition. Who'd be against equal rights for women? So we just kept passing women's rights legislation. Uh, close quote. And so this is not an inaccurate read of the situation uh, in the early 70s. Many scholars would point to the early 70s as the peak political influence of feminists. Uh, in 1972, more women ran for Congress than ever before. The 92nd Congress, which is 71 to 72, passed more women's rights bills than in all previous legislative sessions combined, uh, including Title IX was, was passed in 72. Finally, of course, <laughs> the ERA. Uh, March 1972 was when the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by the Senate. Um, it had been passed by the House in October of 71, but it comes out of the Sen Senate uh, and goes for ratification in 72. Uh, even Strom Thurmond voted for it. Uh, Nixon endorsed it. And so I think this is one thing we really need to understand about gender politics in the early 1970s uh, is that it was not really a partisan issue in the same way it is today. There were plenty of Republican supporters of the ERA, plenty of Republican feminists that some scholars have even said there was a, a, a sort of feminist establishment uh, of the early 1970s that was really actually very influential in Washington. Another thing that I think is really important to understand about 72 in relation to women's political history is that it witnessed the groundbreaking presidential campaign of Shirley Chisholm. Uh, so she was the first African-American woman elected to Congress in 1968 and she was a founding member of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus. And so she decided to run for president in 72. And this is a definite challenge to the party leadership uh, and to the many other white men who were running for the nomination. So the party had 11 people running for the presidential nomination uh, in 72. Uh, she announced her candidacy. We don't have a lot of time, but I have a long quote here of announcing her candidacy. The key lines though are the first two, which is, uh, I'm not the candidate for Black America, although I'm Black and proud. I'm not the candidate for, of the women's movement in this country, although I'm a woman and I'm equally proud of that. Um, so she goes on to say that she just doesn't have the sort of celebrity support um, that many other campaigns do, but she says, I am uh, the candidate of the people of America. So Chisholm's base of support were Black activists, feminists, young people, and anti-war activists. So the leftmost parts of the party and really many of the same people who supported McGovern. Um, and this is part of what was a problem for her. Uh, she struggled to make an impact at the convention and at the time was really marginalized by most other politicians in the press. Uh, so we look back now and we actually see her as really, really important that she paved the way for Jassy Jackson's runs in the eighties, Obama's election, Kamala Harris, who's now Biden's running mate has cited her specifically in relation to her own presidential campaign. Uh, but at the time, really, she faced a lot of racism and sexism uh, and was very marginalized. Um, she famously said, uh, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Uh, and that is very much how she treated uh, her candidacy. 
she took it utterly seriously. She would not back down or do any of the kind of conventional niceties of someone doing a symbolic run. Uh, and this was extremely off-putting to many who thought she should sort of step back, uh, let someone who was more likely to win, uh, you know, not take votes from other progressive candidates. And she knew she couldn't win. Um, she still said she still presented herself very much as really going to win. But, you know, on the one hand, she wanted delegates so she could influence the party platform and have more weight uh, within the party. On the other hand, she also just really wanted to highlight all the assumptions that were made about a black woman candidate, right? That she shouldn't take her campaign so seriously or pursue it just as vigorously as a white man. Uh, so she, she really fought hard through this campaign to, to be taken seriously. So my final point about women in the 72 election is that I think it's also important to understand that not all women uh, coming into politics at this time were feminists, civil rights supporters, or opposed to the Vietnam War. And one of the things that's interesting about the 70s is that it's a moment where women are really driving the discussion of women's issues from all angles. Case in point, of course, is Phyllis Schlafly, who Dr. Marler mentioned. Uh, so she was a conservative intellectual and activist. Again, she had made her mark really uh, in sort of international foreign policy. She was kind of a Cold War expert. But she founded Stop ERA and became hugely influential among the rising new right movement, um, especially around social issues that she basically organized housewives to fight the Equal Rights Amendment and was incredibly successful, right? This was pivotal to stopping the passage of the ERA. So lesson three, uh, women gained remarkable political prominence and they've gained, uh, I think, uh, they've, they've sort of stayed politically visible and influential ever since. Uh, without 1972, we wouldn't have had, I think, 2018, where a record 117 women won congressional elections across the US and nine governorships. Uh, and to put that in context, before the, the 2018 year of the woman, there was 1992 year of the woman uh, and the record was 54 women elected to Congress. Uh, but so I think, you know, 72 is really critical to making those accomplishments possible. But I think it's also important to, you know, recognize that women didn't always agree then and they still don't. They just, as, just because women enter politics doesn't mean it's going to push politics um, a certain way. So those are my three lessons. We're running really low on time. Uh, but uh, I'll turn it back over to Aram now for the Q&A. Thank you to both uh, Dr. Marler and Dr. Potter for doing this. Uh, with me. We do have some questions in the chat. Uh, there was a question from Charles Belenke that I'll answer now uh, pertaining to 68. And then Scott, there was a question uh, regarding the Democratic Party that, uh, that was geared toward you that you might want to tackle after that. Uh, to Charles's question reg regarded, why did the Democrats lose? Was it about Hubert Humphrey's failure as the Democratic nominee to oppose the war? Uh, or was it the fact that the left wing of the party didn't turn out for him? Uh, and that's kind of uh, uh, both, but really a lot of that fault lies with Humphrey himself. Uh, Humphrey had been one, you know, he was the vice president for Johnson, and as early as 1965, he was suggesting, look, there's some other paths we can take with the Vietnam War, uh, but uh, Johnson really shut him out of discussions after that and humiliated him, and he ended up, and Humphrey's personality was as a pleaser, and he ended up just sort of towing the party line, and he was, by 68, he was just seen as kind of a toady of, Hump, of Johnson. So he never clearly articulated his own Vietnam policy heading into the 68 convention. Uh, Humphrey wanted to follow a more a line that was going to be uh, that would please both the left and the anti-Vietnam, uh, anti-war aspect of the party and those who supported the war. He thought he could find a space in the middle. But Johnson kept nixing every every proposal he came with and saying that it would hurt his negotiation strategy. So that left Humphrey in a bind. Uh, he was just seen as kind of, John, of Johnson's toady. And he didn't really come up with his own point of view on the Vietnam War, his own speech until the last day of September, uh, about six weeks before the election. Uh, and by that time, and he was at a real low point by then. And by then, that's when he started to make a little bit of a comeback. And he had this unique opportunity because Wallace was taking votes away from the Republican Party. So he could have snuck in. Um, but it was too late. And another aspect that really doomed him was that McCarthy, as kind of the spokesman of the anti-war faction, refused to endorse him until the very last minute. And even then gave him a very lukewarm endorsement saying something like, um, I'm voting for him and I think you should suffer too. Uh, McCarthy was kind of a jerk then. Uh, so that, that's really where the rift was developed uh, over Vietnam and particularly Humphrey's failure to bring it together. So uh, that, Scott, do you want to tackle that other question about the Democratic Party? Uh, I guess you're referring to the question about the Republican realignment with regard to race. Um, 
So someone made the point, you know, I said, well, at the 1964 election, most Republicans were um, against desegregation. Um, and that was indeed the case to, to which, uh, I guess a student replied that the Democratic Party were the ones who founded the KKK, were for slavery and segregation and other things that harm minority communities. The assumption there, and that's kind of a Republican talking point these days, um, is that parties don't change ideologically over time. And in fact, they do. Uh, that's why political scientists spend so much time tracing uh, the processes by which parties realign themselves, not just by region, but by ideology. You could see the Republican Party shifting from its roots as, and again, it's also hard to call conservative and liberal static categories over time, but you can see the Republican Party shifting to become the more conservative of the two parties, uh, probably in the 1896 election. Um, but again, that's a gradual movement. The progressive era throws party alignments all awry. Um, and it's really in the 1932 election uh, that the Democratic Party starts to emerge as the more liberal, decidedly more liberal of the two parties. And that's under the pressures of the Great Depression. That said, the Southern Democratic Party, which had always not allowed Republicans basically um, any voice in the region uh, going back as a result of the Civil War, uh, the Southern Democratic Party was some a party that Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt had to basically genuflect towards, couldn't move his policies too fast without losing some of the Southern Democratic votes in Congress. And he was concerned with getting the rest of his uh, agenda pushed through, particularly in economic terms. Um, it's a complicated story, but by the 1950s, um, we start to see a, a Republican presence in the South um, but that doesn't really emerge fully um, until the Southern National Democratic Party starts to come out in favor um, of civil rights um, in the late 50s and early 60s. And that's one of the things about the 1964 election that I didn't mention was that it was the first one that saw this kind of um, shift, uh, a completion of a shift that had begun during the New Deal of black Americans into the Democratic Party away from their traditional home in the Republican Party. And at the same time, 1964 election was the last time um, that white voters in the South gave a majority of their votes um, to a Democratic candidate. And that's never happened again. Thanks, Scott. Sarah, there are two interrelated questions uh, asking about women and politics and, and historical memory. One from Isabel asking about uh, perhaps why voters don't know the name of Shirley Chisholm and maybe the same thing could be said of a Phyllis Schlafly or, or Bella Abzug or any number of women in politics in the 70s. Uh, and then another question of, uh, asking, um, why did women's politics seem to stagnate after this high point uh, of, uh, you know, of uh, the early 70s? Yeah. Any thoughts on those? So, yeah, so, okay. So I think, you know, as far as why students are surprised or don't know. I mean, I, you know, I think Shirley Chisholm has actually sort of come even actually as we put this together, right? Dr. Marler like kept emailing me articles he saw, right? That, that she sort of has had a moment actually uh, because of how many black women ran for the nomination this year. Um, so, you know, I think she's sort of coming back in um, and people are kind of recognizing how important she really was. Um, she was, I think, you know, fairly, I don't want to say ridiculed, but you know, she was she was very marginalized in '72. She had she actually sued to get access to the uh, debates. She was not going to be on the debate stage in California, which was really critical. Uh, and so she sued to get access and to be a part of those debates, right? I mean, so she was she was like constantly fighting and was often portrayed as um, as not knowing her place, right? And so um, so I think that's part of why she was sort of forgotten. It's because she people believed that she was marginal because that's how she was portrayed. Um, even though if you sort of step back and look at what was really going on, she wasn't. Um, as far as uh, women stagnating in political power after the 70s, I don't know that I would say that. I mean, I, the point is that actually that was the peak of feminist uh, political power uh, and in the early 70s. So I think, I don't know that I would say that feminists totally stagnated, but they certainly didn't have as much influence in Washington after the kind of 70s, you know, I mean, the, the partly as the ERA campaign fell apart and as the, it was never ratified, um, you know, sort of the tide turned against the ERA, 
uh, you know, even they were given extra years to try and get more ratifications. And they, by 1982, they never got it ratified. Um, you know, so you have this moment when the ERA is first passed, when all of these states ratify, like really quickly, like within hours, there were some states ratifying. Uh, and within a few days, right? So it looked like it was a slam dunk and then it just stalled out partly because of Schlafly's organizing against it uh, and the growing power of the new right, which started to organize around moral issues uh, that, that suddenly it lost favor. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that women lost political power. I think feminists lost, uh, especially sort of national level political power. Although I think they continued to organize quite a bit locally and at grassroots and, uh, you know, that it's not sort of the end of that story. Um, you know, otherwise, of course, there were plenty of conservative women who moved into positions of power. I mean, that, that you know, Reagan appointed some women, right? There wasn't, and O'Connor gets on the court, right? I mean, that the 80s uh, were not a great period for feminism, but that doesn't mean that they weren't a period of, of, some, of, of, of some women, you know, being politically powerful. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say women's politics stagnated. I would say, you know, feminism at least struggled at the, the national level. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there are a couple other good questions in the chat, but uh, as I promised, we were going to end at seven o'clock to respect your time. Uh, so we want to thank everyone who came out tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marlon and Dr. Potter for the fascinating presentations. Thanks to all our history majors. Make sure you're signing up for your classes. We got a great slate of upper division courses that you can check out, talk to your advisors, take some classes, take as many history classes as you can, take them early and often. Um, hope everybody is well. Uh, try to stay safe out there. And thank you for joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.